Good afternoon, everyone, and good morning, depending on where you're calling in from. I appreciate everybody getting on uh, the call. Hello to everyone. Um, we're going to be doing a webcast. It's going to be a little bit of a mix of healthcare reform certification and understanding uh, the history and the benefits of healthcare reform certification. And then uh, towards the end, we're going to have one of our national healthcare reform experts come on the call where you can ask any questions that you would like. Um, and we're going to be doing a lot more of Ask the Experts, uh, you, know, you know, every month where you'll be able to call in, um, especially for students uh, and people who have graduated our Certified Healthcare Reform Specialist course. And then <coughs> I'll also talk a little about, in a little while, about a new Ask the Expert um, uh, benefit that we're rolling out um, very, very shortly. So some of the key takeaways is going to be, uh, in the beginning before we move over to Ask the Experts, is um, you know, what is healthcare reform certification, the CRIS program, what's it going to do for you, um, and what are some of the benefits that you're going to get from. Um, so most of you know me, for those of you who don't, I'm Jonathan Edelheit, um, founder and president of the Healthcare Reform Center and Policy Institute and editor-in-chief of Healthcare Reform Magazine. Um, we are the leading nonprofit bipartisan think tank in healthcare reform. Um, we do training and certification um, and education all over the country in different cities on a local basis and national basis. Um, and we publish the only healthcare reform magazine in the country. And for those of you out there, I just want to let you know, um, we are moving and going to be having some uh, new guest authors um, starting to write for the healthcare reform magazine. So if you feel like you're an expert and you want to write, uh, whether it's weekly or monthly, um, and reach all your peers and colleagues in the industry, please uh, feel free to reach out to me. Um, we're rolling out a whole new functionality with the Healthcare Reform Magazine, and you're, um, anyone who is a very good writer and can, can write intelligent, kind of um, non-biased, bipartisan content, we'd love to have you participate in the Healthcare Reform Magazine. Um, we're expecting to hit a couple hundred thousand readers of the magazine. Um, by 2015. Um, so with that, I already mentioned a little bit about Healthcare Reform Center and Policy Institute. Um, we're one of the only organizations in the country <laughs> that's actually um, coordinating with the administration in education and healthcare reform. For those of you who were at our National Healthcare Reform Conference last year in D.C., um, you will see that by the fact that um, you know, three of the top leaders in the administration coming to speak and present on what's going on with health care reform. Um, and we're really excited about that kind of collaboration that we have with the administration in regards to health care reform because there's no other organization out there that has it, no other nonprofit trade association or conference um, that's really collaborating. And I think that's important because whether you like health care reform or not, it's here to stay. Um, and it's important to understand the perspective of the actual people enforcing the law from the DOL, the IRS, and the HHS. Um, so three, um, three uh, courses and modules that are in our program, um, you get to get perspective from the DOL, IRS, and HHS. You have Phyllis Borzai from the Department of Labor, who's one of the um, people who's pretty much putting out most of the rules and regs in health care reform and the Affordable Care Act, although you know, many of you might not know. We've got Alan Tashunsky, um, Deputy Association Chief Counsel for the um, U.S. Treasury. He's the one who's in charge of all fines and fines for the Affordable Care Act. Um, so you get to understand through our course the uh, IRS's view and also what's going on with the law and how they're going to enforce it. Um, and I think that's extremely important because there's nowhere else you can get that information. They're not out talking anywhere else. And certainly you can't learn from um, watching the news because it's all extremely biased. We have Kristen Blink Young, uh, who was Director of Coverage Policy, Office of Healthcare Reform for the U.S. Uh, Department of Health and Human Services. So you get the HHS perspective, the IRS perspective, and the Department of Labor perspective. So the thing that really um, makes our program special is our instructors. They're the national experts and leaders in the industry. It's it's not your peers and colleagues. It's the top leaders that are involved with the actual uh, law. So uh, some core competencies of what you're going to learn with the course, um, employer mandate and measurement periods, uh, final rules and regulations, um, strategically communicating with employees on the Affordable Care Act, the ACA's endorsement and expansion of wellness incentives, um, compliance issues, deadlines and roadmaps, avoiding litigation, 
uh, workforce cost savings tools, state, federal, and private exchanges, opportunities for small business and healthcare reform, and other rules and uh, regs and interpretations. Um, so I, I think one of the key things is the final rules and regulations were released um, over a month ago, and that means, you know, and we, we've known that here at the Healthcare Reform Center and Policy Institute, but that means the law is here. Um, it's not going anywhere, and you have to get trained. You have to get certified. If you don't, um, and you are um, a agent, broker, or consultant, you will lose business or get replaced by agents who are trained or certified. It, it's as simple as that. Um, there's no way to stay on way for you to stay on top of the law yourself. And one of the benefits of the Healthcare Reform Center and Policy Institute programs is it's taught by the leaders and it tells you exactly what's happening and how you need to comply and how you need to stay on top of things. And then we give you continuous updates on the law. And the reason I say that's so important is you can't get that information anywhere else. Um, the Healthcare Reform Center and Policy Institute, we now reach half a million HR and insurance executives around the country through our database and magazine. And we reach um, uh, through some different groups we manage, um, about 300,000. Uh, executives on just LinkedIn in about 40 different groups. We have one group on LinkedIn with about 27,000 HR and insurance execs. Um, and, you know, there's so much misinformation in the past that was given on health care reform when um, it was being brought up back in 2010. We were the first and only ones in the country, literally for almost one to two years starting in 2010, to tell agents, brokers, and consultants your commissions are going away. The, that's what the government is doing, both state and federal, um, and that's what the insurance companies are positioning you for. So other trade associations went ahead and were trying to say, no, um, your agents are going to be fine. Don't worry about it. You know, pay your dues. Um, but but I think that's that. You know, we tell you exactly the way it is, um, so that you can make intelligent decisions based upon that. Um, so if we look at some of the other content for the course. Um, we have, we, you know, the examination of the Affordable Care Act uh, impact. Um, we, we have two modules just on the insurance mandates on employer-sponsored group health plans. We have uh, Affordable Care Act taxes, taxes, and more taxes. Um, essential health benefits, what's next for health care, um, IRS guidance in determining full-time and part-time status. Um, fiduciary fundamentals under ERISA, that's really important because um, one of the things that <laughs> oh, most people don't know, and we know this because we're very active with the administration, is that the Affordable Care Act is underfunded, um, and they're going to fund it through fines, and those fines will come under ERISA, under fiduciary requirements, or under HIPAA violations. And for the HIPAA violations, some of those fines are pretty much coming out on average for large companies at a million dollars. Um, so the stakes are very high. And, you know, unfortunately what we're seeing is a lot of employers getting bad advice. Um, you know, you have this, you have this kind of um, shell game, um, like the kind of that street game where you move the shell and you get the three little cups. Um, you have within the employer, you'll have the HR department saying payroll is responsible for the ACA. Payroll says, oh no, benefits is responsible for the ACA. And then someone along there will say, well, my agent, broker, or consultant are responsible for the ACA. And then a lot of the agents and brokers are saying, well, I've read up on the law, I've watched some news, um, I've attended an event or two, therefore I know the ACA and I really don't need to learn it anymore, or my carrier uh, carriers I work with are going to teach me. And, and <coughs> that's simply not going to work, um, especially with some of the private roundtables. Like at, our, um, at the Healthcare Reform Conference last year, we had, um, many people don't even know we had this, about 10 to 15 of the, the largest employers in the country sitting around the table with those key people from the HHS, IRS, DOL. Never happened before, hasn't happened since, will happen again at our conference this year in D.C. in September, talking about, you know, what are the employer's concerns, what does the government need to do to change things, and or address things or, or um, provide more guidance on it, and what things the employers don't have to worry about and what things they do. So basically you have guidance of, you know what, um, you don't need to worry about this fine or this compliance issue. That's going to be faded out four months from now. But you need to worry about this thing because this is going to be a massive fine under health care reform. And, the, and so my point of saying that is if you're not learning from those, the, the DOL, HHS, and IRS, and the national attorneys who either drafted the bill and are up on the Hill every day 
dealing with Congress and dealing with the, the treated big three from the governmental agencies, you're not going to know what's coming, and you're not going to know the nuances and what, what you have to worry about and what you don't have to. Um, and I, you know, I, I think uh, you know, one of the neat things that we're rolling out here, and it's not in this PowerPoint, um, but we have Ask the Expert Service. Um, and we're going to be rolling this out in partnership with um, a, a top national law firm that it's going to be um, where you can ask an unlimited amount of questions to top attorneys through our technology solution and get answers back you know, very, very fast. Um, so you could be out in the field with your client at an employer um, and get the answers you need without having to pay an attorney $500, $1,000 an hour. This, the, there's going to be three different levels to ask the experts. And one's going to start at like five to ten questions. There's going to be three or four levels. But the top level is unlimited questions and answers. And that is actually going to be offered out of the marketplace from insurance agencies for $3,000 a month. Um, but if you're going through the Certified Healthcare Reform Specialist Program, um, it's actually going to be included in that program. Um, so I think that's, uh, you know, it's really an amazing benefit um, that we've worked out with our top national uh, partners. So it's good to know just uh, kind of what's, what's coming in that area um, with the Ask the Experts. I think it's going to be an amazing tool. Um, now this slide probably shouldn't have broken it out into two slides because, um, you know, it's a little crunched in there. But as you can see, it kind of shows all the different courses. So one of the things that we're doing with our healthcare reform program is a lot of companies are, are now bringing us in to do training. Um, so it's something that, you know, if you don't want to get all of your employees certified, um, you can actually um, get them trained. Um, so we can customize the modules in the training program and provide a license um, where support staff and administrative staff and other people can go through and be trained so they can have intelligent conversations with your customers and clients. Um, one of the things that we've rolled out too for existing CRIS students is our Healthcare Reform Resource Center. Um, and this is going to be a really powerful tool for those of you who are already certified as a healthcare reform specialist. Um, like I see Mary on this on the call now. Is you're going to be able to go on and it's a, you know, it's a dedicated uh, site just for the CRIS students where you can pull up webcasts, um, a library of information tools and resources kind of at your fingertips, whether it's on your iPhone, smartphone, your iPad or your laptop. Um, you're going to be able to pull up updates on, on the health care reform law. And we're also going to be launching a system um, very shortly where um, you're going to have a, a newsletter that the Health Care Reform Center and Policy Institute, when updates happen with the Affordable Care Act, we're going to provide a template where you as an agent or as an employer can take that and distribute that, whether it's your clients or internally within your organization, as if it's from your company. Um, so it's going to be like having your own in-house general counsel that's going to constantly be updating um, your customers and your clients on what's going on with health care reform. Um, so that's a tool that we've been developing over the past six months. It's going to be, um, you know, very, uh, very um, I think, educational and making you guys look like uh, the thought leader. So um, if anyone, you know, would like to do a demo of the health care reform uh, resource center, if you're an existing Chris student, please uh, call, um, you know, Miguel or one of our health care reform certification coordinators. So we can walk you through either the Ask the Experts or the, the, um, the Health Care Reform Resource Center. Um, so with our um, uh, CRIS program now, we're also offering a special where if you get certified, you can attend the conference um, complimentary, um, which is a $1,000 value. And our conference is going to be uh, September 20th through the 24th in Washington, D.C. Um, so I hope all of you can make it there. Um, we're going to be starting to, you know, the question and answer at approximately 2.30, where one of our top um, health care reform instructors will come on, Ben Connolly, and be able to answer um, questions and answers that you have, because I know um, some questions came in about when the Q&A would start. Um, so, you know, what are some of the real reasons to become certified as, you know, Chris, increased revenue and driving new business opportunities, um, maintain existing, um, you know, business advice with up-to-date information, and, you know, a lot of, uh, I don't think we have our stats in here. We should really have our stats from the research we've done um, through our, uh, all our CRIS students. But I think it was like 90, 92% of students felt they were able to put on new business, maintain existing business. 
um, and they're getting more speaking opportunities. Um, and George Washington found that when you get a professional certification, it could boost your lifetime earnings by about $117,000. Um, for those of you who are working within an agency or company, we do do live group training where we can actually send someone out to your office to train all your employees or do it live via webcast. Um, our program is national CE approved, so you can get up to 12 uh, CE credits nationally as an agent or consultant, and I think it's up to 8 or 10 if you're an HR executive or professional. Um, so for HR, we have a separate designation, which is Certified Healthcare Reform Professional. Instead of the 21 modules, um, it's going to be 12 modules of education um, for HR professionals. So I think one of the important things that I always cover um, when it comes to certification, if you're not certified and trained in healthcare reform, why are you waiting? What are you waiting for? Um, you know, some of the answers that we get from people are, we're waiting because you know we're really busy, or we're dealing with enrollment, um, and I just don't have time to get trained or certified in healthcare reform because I'm busy with my existing business. And I, I think the reality of the situation is, you know, if you don't get trained and certified, then you are going to end up losing existing clients and have less of a chance of bringing on new clients because that agent who's at the cutting edge who is trained and certified is going to be able to take away business from you and be able to bring on the new clients. And that's the matter with everything. It's kind of like saying, I'm going to go out and practice law as an attorney, but I'm not going to go out and get my JD, my Juris Doctorate. I'm just going to read some books, um, watch some shows, and therefore I'm going to be an expert. And um, people are just going to recognize me as an expert. And one of the challenges is, is now that the final rules and regulations are here, um, you know, how do you differentiate yourself today? And then if we look at 2015, how are you going to differentiate yourself in 2015? Because there's going to be more agents, brokers, and consultants. And then I think you've got navigators out there. Um, and beyond that, you're going to have a lot of people who are going to start getting into this industry saying they're going to be guiding people in healthcare reform who are insurance agents, brokers, or consultants. They're not HR. They just came from a different industry. And maybe they charge people a fee to provide them education or training. It could be, you know, CPAs or accountants. And, you know, it's gonna, the market's going to get extremely diluted. And how do you set yourself apart from all those people? And it's having a designation, having a seal attached to it. Um, because the reality is, you know, immediate perception is everything. You get one chance to make a first impression. And how are people going to remember you? If you're, you know, I look at this as anything. If you're going in... Um, you know, to a uh, to a you know an employer, a potential client, and there's you know 20 agents competing for that business, and they're, you're all handing them the business card and talking to them. What's going to set them set you apart from everybody else? And the answer is a certification um, or a designation. Um, you know, I know uh, when I deal with um, I, I do a lot of uh, guidance also from employers and things such as like corporate wellness and stuff and they're looking for someone who really understands corporate wellness, understands their programs and challenges. So it doesn't matter whether it's healthcare reform or corporate wellness, it's you have to set yourself apart. And I think, I think the industry has really changed. You know, if we look at it from the group rep perspective of, uh, you know, reps for group insurance carriers, in the past it all used to be, hey, I don't, you know, I would say maybe 20, 30 years ago, they knew their product, they knew their competition's product, and they would have educated conversations with agents and brokers and employers. And then, you know, when I was back in the day running a national TPA, I would say about 10 to 15 years ago, you know, it had emerged into simply let me take you out to lunch or let me take you out for a round of golf. But by the way, I don't know my products or services. Um, you know, that doesn't work anymore. Spreadsheeting doesn't work. Um, you know, there has to be, you know, a consultative approach in regard to the Affordable Care Act. Um, and anyone can say they're knowledgeable. I mean, you know, it's, it's amazing. I talked to some agents um, that I've known in the industry for 15 years, um, you know, some of them that are top, top experts in healthcare reform, and they, they, they say the same things. And they, what they say is that they're bumping in and dealing with employers who agents are going in and telling them they're experts and they're giving them bad advice and they're having to pick up the pieces. So, um, you know, employers are seeking, you know, people who have graduated from our CRIS program or CHIRP program. Um, as I said earlier, we reach about a half a million HR and insurance executives, um, and we market our program out to them through our magazines, um, through the 300,000 people in our social media channels, and also um, 
uh, through our email database. We reach a couple hundred thousand people. So. Um, and so it's important, and you know, for HR professionals that are on this webcast, getting your TERP certification as an HR uh, healthcare reform professional, I think it's critical to job advancement, and promotion, and pay raises, um, because as employers get, uh, you know, get to feel the crunch financially in regard to the Affordable Care Act, um, they're definitely going to be looking for people who really understand it. But I think that the Affordable Care Act prevents, uh, presents tremendous opportunity for creative agents, brokers, and HR professionals because for the first time ever, everyone's focused on innovation. And they're focused on what can we do that's cutting edge, um, that is uh, cutting edge that's really going to, um, um, you know, lower health care costs and be a game changer. Because, you know, we've seen them try consumer-driven plans. We've seen them try high deductible plans <laughs> with very little effect. We've seen, um, uh, you know, we've seen um, a lot of other different things tried and costs not going down. We know that the costs are going up under the Affordable Care Act, and therefore, if you're not doing innovation, you're not going to lower costs. And this is what employers are looking for. They're not looking for the status quo. They're looking for people bringing in things that are just outside the box. And we kind of, um, you know, kind of sit at the center here, uh, uh, I would say, of that innovation, because we have people who are coming to us all the time and sharing what they're doing innovative at the industry, and some of it is amazing. I think, um, I think what you're going to see. <clears throat> over the next three years is a totally different industry than any of you actually experience it today. It's going to be night and day difference. Um, there's a huge movement coming where employers are going to get their employees active at the workplace with gyms, corporate fitness, corporate nutrition, uh, wearable, uh, trackable wearable devi devices. Um, there's a huge shift with M Health. If all of you missed it through a couple months ago, Samsung just did a, a big deal with um, Cigna in mobile health solutions for employees. So a ton of stuff is going to be putting mobile health devices into employees' hands that have health conditions to monitor and keep them on track and out of the hospital and out of surgery. And then, you know, so it's going to be for the sick and risk population, and then it's going to be not also not for the sick. And then we have very innovative things out there like, you know, domestic medical tourism and centers of excellence like Lowe's partnering with Pepsi. Uh, I'm sorry, Lowe's, not Lowe's partnering with Pepsi, Lowe's partnering with um, Cleveland Clinic, Pepsi partnering with Johns Hopkins, if any of you didn't see it, um, HSM manufacturing out of North Carolina, saving $10 million over five years, sending employees to Costa Rica and India for surgery where the cost is about 90% less. So the whole industry is changing. Um, and you need to change with it. And you really need to stand out, um, stand out from the cr crowd and um, and really look at what's happening, not in today in the industry, but what's happening over the next couple of years and making that happen. So going back to the certification, sorry, sometimes I digress a little, get a little passionate about some of the cutting edge things um, that are happening, is, um, is the continuing education that happens once you get your certification. So as I mentioned before, and, and I got a question in from um, Geronimo, um, is, um, is the training good for CE credits for agents in Florida? Yes. It's nationally approved all over the country. I believe it's about 12 hours. Um, and you can use your certification on the business card. So you get the seal that's on there that says Certified Healthcare Reform Specialist. Um, and you, you, you get to use the designation. But we provide uh, monthly updates on the Affordable Care Act and what's going on in rules and regs. And I think that's more, almost as equally as important as the actual certification. So for those of you that, that, that weren't aware, about a year ago, um, there was uh, a um, Health and Human Services FAQ they released. It wasn't a rule, wasn't a regulation. Just here are some questions and answers. We're quietly releasing on our website, and we're not sharing it with anyone. And on that, with Q6, and Q6, the way the language read, basically eliminated limited medical plans and gap plans. And it wasn't eliminated in the future, it was kind of, hey, by the way, this is no longer allowed, you know, and it wasn't, it wasn't pushed out there. So potentially overnight, you know, any agent writing those mini med plans or gap plans could have been in violation for the law and employers could have gotten fined. Now those issues were resolved, there was some lobbying done, but what you have to realize is that the government is going to legislate without legislating. So there are going to be changes under the ACA where things are very quietly released into the night without any real discussion. And if you're not on top of that and aren't getting those updates, you're going to be in real trouble. Um, 
one of those is if any of you were paying attention a month or two ago, they were talking about months ago how um, you know they released. Uh, I believe it was it was the IRS, um, maybe it was HSS, but I think it was the IRS. And it was about how people can get out of the individual mandate by just stating it's a hardship, and it was a hardship exemption. But it wasn't something they broadcast, and someone found it. All the media, all the press, all the think tanks looking and, and, and on, on top of what's going on with the ACA with all three gov government divisions, this slipped under the radar of almost everyone for months. It was out on a website. Um, so it's critical, and, and you know, having this knowledge is what's going to you know, make you really successful in, um, in what you do. So um, this is an example for Geronimo. Um, the question uh, that you had asked with the, where you can see on the business card the actual seal and the designation. Um, uh, you also can, I, I also recommend that you put the designation as an existing title. Um, so your certified healthcare reform specialist is a company like that you're currently with on LinkedIn because then um, employers and other uh, agents or brokers who are looking for an expert, they'll see that immediately on your profile and then it'll show up without them necessarily having to click on your exact page. Um, and you know, LinkedIn is an extremely powerful tool from the marketing side. So we also market all of our Chris students through our um, magazine. Um, and uh, you can't really see it here, it's a little smaller, so the next time we'll probably try to break that out a little bit bigger. Um, but you can look at who's been certified, actually um, uh, search by city or state, and then click and contact that person directly through the website. Um, and then you actually get a diploma um, uh, a nice frame diploma that you can put on your wall. Um, for those of you that <coughs> excuse me, um, are not on uh, in our LinkedIn group, I definitely recommend for you to join our healthcare reform LinkedIn group. Um, we have, I think, about 27,000 members. Um, you know, we're adding about 1,000 people a month. And on, on that LinkedIn group, if you just search under LinkedIn under healthcare reform, we'll show up uh, as, as um, really one of the only groups, the largest group. But a lot of the updates and the changes um, are posted in there. And sometimes you'll see something posted in that LinkedIn group that two to three days later you'll see on CNN or Fox News. Um, so it's the most updated place you can get info. And then you get a lot of people talking about it, discussing it. Um, so the Certified Healthcare Reform Specialist designation is 995. Um, our instructors are um, you know, top firms. We have the American Medical Association. I already mentioned the IRS, DOL, HHS. Um, top law firms like Proscower, Constangi, Seifert, Shaw, Venable, Mince Levin, Deloitte. Um, and this is a picture of all our different instructors. Um, you can actually go on our website and look at the whole curriculum. It's at healthcarereformcertification.com. You can look at the curriculum um, and you can actually look at who the uh, instructors are and their bios. And, and as I said before, these are all national attorneys. Um, and our course is taken in two ways. You can take it online through our learning management system where you can take it at your own pace. And we know you're busy, so it's built in a way that um, you, know, you, you can use it um, you know, at home, your iPad, your tablet. You know, if you've got your mobile phone and you're, you're, you're waiting to pick your kids up at school, you can pop on your mobile phone and keep watching the videos. Um, it's a very sophisticated learning management system built for the busy professional. Um, you know, afterwards, you know, you can get your uh, your jacket with your seal if you're going to go out golfing or coffee mug or pen. Um, I want to talk a little bit about social media, and, and I think it's really important, and that ties back to what I was saying, put your designation as a current title on your LinkedIn profile. <laughs> We're going to start doing a little bit of more of education um, on, on how to utilize LinkedIn. I think it's one of the most underutilized benefits, um, and, and I really want to help our Chris, um, Chris graduates with it. We just did a survey of the entire industry, and we had about 800 agents, brokers, consultants, and HR and benefit managers that responded to the poll. And 83.6% of agent and brokers received their industry updates and news from social media, with LinkedIn being the top source. And um, I mean, that's, that's huge. And 65.5% of agents and brokers feel they receive the most timely and updated information and news from social media where only 21.8% get it from trade magazines. So social media, and specifically LinkedIn, is you know, three times more of an updated news source um, than anything else, whether it's TV or trade magazines. 
And, you know, 51% of agents and brokers have chosen an insurance or employee benefit service product or new vendor from social media. And 93% of HR and benefit managers receive their industry news from social media, twice as much as trade magazines. Um, so the results differ a little between HR and benefit managers and agents, but this is where everybody is doing business. Um, and uh, this is where we've, you know, we have gotten a very large following because now in 40 different groups we reach about 300,000 executives, and that number is doubling every year. Um, and so you, you know, you should stay tuned for some of our, um, uh, you know, LinkedIn uh, webcasts will do really helping you know how to take LinkedIn um, to that level. But we do a lot of our education through LinkedIn. We push out our webcasts, our white papers, our polls, a lot of it through LinkedIn. Um, we also are rolling out. Uh, national road shows. Um, we did a bunch last year. Um, you know, for those of you who missed them, we had some really great events: New Orleans, Baton Rouge, uh, Houston, um, Los Angeles, San Diego. Um, really sold out events. And um, this is where, as an agent, broker, consultant, you can get CRIS certified, or as an HR executive, um, CHRP certified. So we've already got our date set for our next three events. He's going to roll all across the nation. Um, but the next one is going to be in Washington, D.C., Virginia. It's going to be May 20th. Um, then we're going to have one in Atlanta, um, which is June uh, 11th, and then one in Tampa, June 17th. Um, so, I, I, you know, if you're in those cities, if you know someone, please refer them over. If you are um, interested in us bringing a roadshow to your city, please let us know. If you're an agent, broker, or consultant, um, one creative thing we've seen others have done a pass through some of our roadshows is uh, basically go to one of your local carriers that you write business with and tell them that you want them to sponsor you or a couple people from your firm or agency um, to go to one of our workshops. Um, and that's worked pretty successfully. It's just like them buying a table um, at a local meeting. So, um, you know, I'm sure many of you have been to our National Healthcare Reform Conference and Employer Healthcare and Benefits Congress. I invite all of you um, to make sure that you keep it on your calendar for this year. Um, we, should, we should have probably had the dates on, uh, on this slide, but it's September 20th through the 24th in Washington, D.C. We're going to have about 200 speakers. It's going to be a big, our biggest year yet. Um, we, uh, you, you know, last year we had about 2,200 attendees. We're shooting for about 3,000. We're having about 40 to 50 percent. Um, growth each year, and we really have some amazing speakers. Um, Alan Tashunsky, who I mentioned before from the IRS, has already confirmed as a keynote speaker, and he's also speaking at our um, Washington and uh, Virginia Roadshow that we're doing, and um, we're trying to get confirmation of him and the other th big three for the other roadshows we're pushing out um, along the country. Um, but we have a lot of big employers that are confirmed um, uh, for our show this year. I think HP, Walmart, and uh, and a bunch of others doing a lot of big case studies. But we have about eight tracks. And if there are any of you who follow the TED conference, um, it's kind of like all about innovation. This is like what ours is for the employee benefits space. Um, we have everything that's going on in corporate wellness, everything that's going on in corporate nutrition and fitness, everything that's going on in healthcare reform. We have about 20 speakers on healthcare reform, about 10 speakers just on private and public healthcare exchanges. Um, we, you know, we, we have uh, speakers on that come for dedicated tracks on self-funding, voluntary benefits, um, mobile health. Um, we're going to have some innovation summits. And then really importantly, we're going to have a employee benefits consultant um, business leadership summit and an HR uh, leadership summit where we're really going to be teaching everyone how to become a leader in today's industry. And we're literally getting about eight different keynotes of these amazing dynamic national speakers who are going to kind of motivate everyone to take their careers to the next level, come speak in that leadership track. Um, so um, if you have any questions about the healthcare reform training um, that we can do live in your offices or the certification, um, for those who are on the webcast, there's going to be a 15% discount where you can just use the code CERTIFYMENOW at um, healthcarereformcertification.com. And with that, I am hoping that our co-panelist, um, Ben Connolly, is on the call so we can start um, answering some of the questions that came on. Um, and let me see real quick. Uh, ben, are you on the call? Let's see if we'll get him on the call in a minute. Maybe my IT guy will get him. So at this point in time, if you guys want to start typing in questions, um, I know some of you are. Hey, Ben. Hey, how are you? Good. How are you doing? Great. Thanks. 
Thank you for joining us today. Um, and I know we've got a bunch of questions that have already come in, and this is the fun part. Um, so I'm going to fire you off some questions. Um, I, have, have you uh, looked at the questions, or would you like me to read them off to you? Uh, I think I see one that popped up here, which I can address. Uh, and this talks about uh, modifications to the definition of full-time employee. As, as everyone's aware, at present under the law, a full-time employee is defined as 30 hours, somebody working on average 30 hours a week. Uh, now, this sort of trumps any underlying plan eligibility rules you may have set under your own plan. So if the IRS does full-time at 30 hours a week, that's sort of what you, want, what you need to go with unless you, uh, you know, want to run the risk of being penalized. Uh, the question specifically is uh, that there are rumors that Congress is considering legislation that would change the definition of full-time specifically from 30 hours a week to 40 hours a week. And the question was whether that legislation is going anywhere. Uh, that legislation did, I believe, pass the House of Representatives, um, as has legislation to repeal the Affordable Care Act over 50 times. Um, so whether that goes anywhere I think remains to be seen, but I think there's substantial resistance to that change, both in the Senate and obviously in the White House, uh, because that would narrow the scope of people covered by this ex sort of expanded coverage uh, umbrella. So, you know, Remains to be seen, maybe take another look after the midterm elections, but for the time being, I think everyone should move ahead planning uh, 30 hours a week as a standard. Hey, Ben, I'm, I'm going to ask uh, just a question to kind of hit home with that. So if I'm an agent on this webcast or an employer, and I say, well, Ben, you know, does that mean I should wait and see if, you know, if I'm trying to figure out who I want to offer coverage to and I've got a lot of, um, part-timers or people who might might work 30 to 35, should I really just wait to see if somehow the Senate passes that side of it too and it gets approved? What, what would your answer be to that? Yeah, that's a great question. And, um, you know, my advice has been to start planning now for a couple of reasons. One is because uh, folks have been taking a wait-and-see approach for quite some time now. Uh, you know, people were waiting until after the 2012 elections and waiting until after the Supreme Court decision. And what we've seen time and again is that people have been underprepared for uh, delayed effective date provisions of the law um, because they've been waiting to see, and, and obviously everything is rolled out according to schedule. This change in particular, the implementation of the employer mandate, is quite an, uh, quite an overhaul, uh, especially for some organizations, from their existing benefit offerings. And uh, while there's no technical or legal requirement that you have to start, you know, now in April 2014 to prepare. Um, what I would say is that there's going to be quite a strain on resources come December 2014 for people trying to prepare for January 1, 2015. Um, so the earlier you get started, the better. Um, and I know that uh, among our clients, quite a few have already started at least preliminary considerations, if not actual plan reforms, to prepare for the mandate. Thank you. Um, Kathy asks for um, groups with 50 to 99 employees with a non-calendar year plan, will they get transitional relief in 2016, or will their plan have to be compliant by January 1, 2016? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, a lot of the forms of transitional relief are stacked upon one another. In other words, uh, you can take advantage of one across the board and then an additional one going forward. I believe, I would have to confirm, but I believe that this is one of the forms that are stacked. In other words, if you're a mid-sized employer, 50 to 99, you get 2015 for free. And then as an off-calendar year plan, you get into 2016 for free. Uh, again, that's my recollection, um, but uh, that would be something, you know, you've got at least a year and a half to confirm that. Okay. Uh, Michael asked the question, have the tri-agencies ever defined what should be covered under the essential health benefit? specifically in the area of pediatric oral and vision care? Yeah, that's a great question. So the, the, the question of essential health benefits is really a broad encompassing topic that hits on a number of different places. Um, it's important for self-funded and large fully insured plans, that means plans with more than 50 covered lives, um, only for a few discrete reasons. The first is if you have an annual dollar limit in your plan, it cannot apply to any benefit that is an essential health benefit. The second is if you're a non-grandfathered plan, you cannot, uh, any amounts out-of-pocket 
amounts expended towards essential health benefits must accumulate towards an overall plan out-of-pocket maximum. But one thing I do want to make clear is that uh, large fully insured and self-funded plans are not required to cover essential health benefits. This just came up the other day uh, when we were dealing with a group, and we once again confirmed that that's not, the, that's not applicable to large self-funded or large fully insured plans. On the other hand, small fully insured groups, so groups of less than 50 who are purchasing fully insured plans, do actually have to cover every essential health benefit. In other words, if you're offering a group health plan, it must include that whole list of benefits. Now that's the uh, sort of background discussion. More specifically to the question um, of how do you define essential health benefits, if you're in a small group uh, and you are purchasing an insurance policy in your state, uh, uh, yes, uh, the definition of essential health benefits is much more defined. In other words, each state has a benchmark plan that they look to, and that benchmark plan is a existing insurance policy on the market and everything that is covered under that existing insurance policy must be included uh, in, that, in that plan offering. Uh, so it would vary by state, obviously, and you can go to the HHS website and find the benchmark specifically for your state. I know that for benchmarks that didn't previously include things like pediatric, dental, and vision, uh, those plans are required to expand to include those offerings, but that is a finite or defined list that you can look to. For large fully insured or for self-funded plans, it's a little bit more uh, hazy in terms of how you define essential health benefits. But one surefire way that you can do it is you can pick any available benchmark. In other words, it doesn't have to be the state in which you sit in. It can be any state. Um, and choose that benchmark, look to the offerings in that benchmark plan, and use that to determine what is an essential health benefit, which, again, for a large fully insured or self-funded plan, doesn't mean you have to cover those benefits. It simply means you have to remove dollar limits on those benefits. Okay. Uh, Deb asked the question, um, what are the most significant changes in worksite wellness associated with um, the ACA, specifically relating to tobacco use, waste management, I'm um, sorry, not waste, but weight management, and health screenings? Yeah, those are all great questions. So uh, the Affordable Care Act did a couple things with wellness programs. Um, first, if you have a health contingent wellness program, meaning you're not just required to participate, but you're actually required to achieve some sort of goal, um, then the penalty or incentive that you can offer has actually been expanded. Previously, the penalty could not exceed 20% of the overall cost of coverage. Now, under the Affordable Care Act, starting in 2014, the penalty can be as great as 30% difference variation between people who meet the goal and don't meet the goal. And if your program relates to tobacco cessation, that variation can actually be 50% of the cost of coverage. And what that means is that if you have an overall plan value of, let's say, $5,000. I'm going to force myself to do some math here. Overall plan value of $5,000, um, and uh, employees are paying $2,500 of that $5,000. Uh, an employee who fails to meet the tobacco standard can actually be required to pay the full $5,000, and that's still allowed. Uh, there were a few other changes. It, notably, they expanded the scope of who must be offered an alternative. Specifically, if you're in this health contingent category, Pretty much anybody who wants a reasonable alternative can get a reasonable alternative. There doesn't need to be a medical reason for it. Uh, wellness programs are a whole separate discussion that we could go, go on for quite a while. The only other note I want to uh, throw out there is there is an interaction with the employer mandate. So the employer mandate looks to affordability, which is the premium assessed to employees for the cost of coverage, and minimum value, which relates to the benefits offered as well as the out-of-pocket costs associated with the plan, so deductible, copay, coinsurance, et cetera. Quite often, people will structure their wellness program in such a way that the premium changes if you fail to satisfy the standard, or the deductible changes if you fail to satisfy the standard. What the IRS has said is when you are assessing the plan's affordability or minimum value for purposes of determining whether you're complying with the employer mandate, you are permitted to assume that if your wellness program relates to tobacco cessation, you can assume every single person passed that wellness standard, even if nobody did. In other words, you look at... Uh, the entire population, the amount they would pay if they certified as a non-smoker, and you can assume everybody paid that amount. On the other hand, if your wellness program relates to anything other than tobacco cessation, uh, you must assume that everyone failed that standard. So look at the two tiers, assume everybody is paying at the higher rate. Uh, so sort of a harsh result there, but it's a demonstration of the administration's attempt to balance 
this, uh, disability discrimination risks against the value of wellness programs? Um, Miriam had a really interesting question that said, you know, if your organization is unionized, what are other companies doing to make changes to their health plan to be in compliance with the ACA when the cost of bargaining agreement is not up for negotiation? Well, that's a really good question. Um, you know, uh, all bets are off when it comes to unionized plans because it's, it's such a unique beast and folks are having to get creative to come into compliance. Um, couple, a couple quick questions or quick responses there. Um, first, uh, m most collectively bargaining, collective bargaining agreements, or the hope would be that most collective bargaining agreements have a reopener provision in it that says if we need to reopen bargaining to comply with any changes required by law, we agree to do so. Not necessarily that we agree to automatically change the plan, but that we agree to open things up and discuss those changes. Um, even if you don't have a reopener, uh, both parties have skin in the game in this regard. Uh, so it might make sense to reach out to the union across the aisle and say, let's talk about an uh, amicable solution here to get us into compliance with the employer mandate. The other point I want to make is that to the extent the employer is contributing to a multi-employer plan, a uh, whole different set of rules apply there. Uh, the multi-employer plan itself is required to comply with many of the mandates and reforms that apply under the Afford Affordable Care Act, such as the adult child coverage rule, the 90-day waiting period limit. But the employer... The employer that's contributing to the multi-employer plan is solely responsible for complying with the employer mandate. So it's kind of a, a tension or a conflict here where uh, the multi-employer plan is not affirmatively obligated to do anything to come into compliance with the employer mandate, but if it fails to do so, you as the contributing employer can be found in violation of the employer mandate. Now that being said, there are special transitional rules that apply to employers contributing to multi-employer plans, which make it somewhat of a lesser burden. Uh, but it doesn't get you out of the woods entirely. You still need to take a couple steps to ensure that the plan you are contributing to ensures your compliance with the employer mandate. And the next question is coming in from Kathy. Um, and it says, if a spouse is eligible for coverage under the employer plan, if the spouse goes to the exchange, will the spouse be eligible for a subsidy regardless of affordability under the employer plan? The answer is generally no. Um, generally, it, this is what is known as the spousal glitch, and what, it, uh, what the general rule is is that uh, if, a, if coverage is offered to a spouse under the employer's plan, that coverage will be considered affordable no matter what the cost charged. Um, so because that spouse has been offered affordable coverage, assuming it is minimum value, that renders the spouse ineligible for subsidies on the exchanges. Uh, so sort of a harsh result. Um, and, you know, as a result, you see some employers simply dropping spousal coverage because under the employer mandate, it's not required that spouses be offered coverage. It's one extreme, obviously, uh, but perhaps an unintended consequence of the administration trying to balance business interests versus individual interests. Okay. Um, and, and one thing is when people are asking questions, please type it into the Q&A box and not the chat box because um, we're going from the Q&A uh, the Q box. Here, here's a very detailed question for you, Ben. Going to, going to test to see whether you had your cup of coffee today. And this is a follow-up to the, uh, a wellness question that was asked earlier from Deb. And she says, following up on the tobacco cessation um, issue raised and employee cost sharing the premium costs, what options are available to employers to certify an employee as a non-smoker? Um, you know, is it a blood test? Uh, like, uh, is it um, salivary uh, codeine? carbon monoxide uh, analyzer at sale breath, what can an employer do to certify that they're a non-smoker? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. And we've seen employers uh, take all of those steps, uh, blood tests, you know, hair follicle analysis, et cetera. Um, and you have to be a little bit cautious about uh, ADA concerns, but I think we've gotten comfortable that smoke, uh, nicotine addiction isn't, isn't a protected benefit under the ADA. Um, so it just depends on how aggressive you want to get. But by all means, we've seen employers uh, require employees to take some fairly invasive tests to certify that they are non-smokers. Now, one of the kinks you have to work out there is that sometimes these tests can produce false positives when somebody lives in a house with a smoker or something to that effect. Uh, so you just have to be careful that you can work through those uh, on an employee-by-employee -employee basis and, and reach an accurate result. Uh, Marion asked a question. It, it is uh, my understanding that an employer can implement additional eligibility rules for part-timers, such as 
part-timers are required to have 750 hours before they can be considered for benefits. Um, is that true? Uh, generally, the, there, are, there are a couple different rules that work there. So the employer mandate defines full-time as somebody averaging 30 hours a week. That uh, amounts to about 1,560 hours a year if you're using a 12-month uh, measurement period. Uh, but generally, the threshold there for full-time is 30 hours a week on the employer mandate. There are other rules that also apply under the Affordable Care Act. For instance, I mentioned the 90-day waiting period limit is a rule that applies to the plan rather than the employer. That rule, the 90-day waiting period limit, applies regardless of whether an individual is full-time. In other words, the rule says you cannot have a waiting period of more than 90 days uh, for any individual uh, who will ultimately become eligible for coverage under the plan. Now, there are some exceptions and variations there, but if you have a plan that covers part-timers, you're generally fine from the employer mandates perspective because you are not required to cover those part-timers, so any coverage they're getting is good. Uh, you know, you're fine there, no penalty. But under the 90-day waiting period limit, uh, you could still face liability from a plan perspective if you're imposing waiting, waiting periods uh, uh, of a length that is greater than what is permitted under that rule. Now, Again, no obligation to cover part-timers under this law. Okay. Um, you know, uh, De Deborah asked if you could clarify the exact um, uh, fines for the individual mandate um, and any, any delays, um, you know, or exceptions to the individual mandate. Yeah, there are a host of delays and exceptions to the individual mandate, but the general rule is that individuals will be subject to a fine that it amounts to the greater of $95 or, I'm sorry, the lesser of $95, let me think about how this works, uh, $95 is the minimum, uh, but if your income is greater, you will be required to pay 1% of your income as, as, a, as a fine. So your fine can easily exceed $95 even in the first year, depending on your income level. Uh, that amount ratchets up over time, so it's always key to the greater of whatever the penalty is, the flat dollar amount or 1% uh, of your income. And I think that in 2016, it's $695 or 1% of your income. Now, that amount will always cap out at the cost of coverage on the exchanges. In other words, you're never going to pay more in, from a fine than you would pay if you went and got health insurance on the exchanges. There are also a number of other exceptions for short, short breaks in coverage of three months or less if you're incarcerated. Uh, there's some one-time exceptions this year for people who are in a health policy that otherwise would not be noncompliant, but that were extended under the law. So, uh, yeah, there are a host of exceptions, but generally speaking, it's 90, the greater of 95 or 1% of your, uh, your income. Um, you know, uh, Michael asked this uh, question, which is uh, an interesting question. Is, you know, do you see the Cadillac tax being abolished prior to 2018? That's a good question, and we hear that a lot. You know, uh, I was just uh, reviewing uh, – uh, some notes from a closed door treasury session where there are some some people some powerful influential people in the United States who are trying to uh, push off or change or delay that Cadillac tax uh, indefinitely. Um, that being said, the cost of the law bakes in the fact that the Cadillac tax will be there and the climate in Washington right now is such that you can never change a law unless there is an equal revenue offset uh, to account for that change. So. Uh, it's an unpopular provision of the law, so there's definitely justification there, probably bipartisan agreement to delay the effect of that Cadillac tax. But whether that will actually take place in form remains to be seen. Um, at this point, I would say it's too soon to say because it's going to depend a lot on the makeup in Washington uh, by the time that provision becomes effective. You know, one question I have for you along with that, Ben, is, you know, when the law was being proposed. Um, you know, we did some uh, educational webcasts, and, you know, I was telling everyone that based on doing, you know, the cost of where single insurance was and family insurance and inflation um, uh, and trends with health insurance, that the majority of Americans would fall under the Cadillac tax. Um, and that was, that was I, it literally took me like 30 seconds to do that calculation, maybe 60 seconds. Um, you know, extrapolating it out to 2018. Why do you think they passed the law knowing that the majority of Americans would qualify under the Cadillac tax? Well, that's a good question and a multi-tiered response, I guess. Um, the first is that uh, they did need a revenue offset, and this was viewed as one potential avenue for a revenue offset. Um, another... And we
When you say revenue offset, can you explain that to people? I'm sorry, yeah. uh, it, the, the law costs money. In other words, there are tax credits on the exchanges that uh, people can get that are subsidized by federal tax dollars, and that creates a deficit unless there is a corresponding uh, revenue elsewhere in the law that offsets those amounts that are flowing out from the government. Um, and so this was a form of revenue that offsets the cost of the law on, a whole, on the whole. Moreover, I think, and if you look at the stated reason behind this Cadillac tax, which whether it's, whether it's true or not remains to be seen, but we got to a point in the United States where health insurance was taking on a form that was unintended. In other words, uh, the average consumer of health insurance didn't have much skin in the game because plans were so rich that they could simply go to the doctor and pay their 5 or $10 copay and never really feel any pain from that. And what that led to was that people were making ineffective medical de decisions that was really driving up the cost of health care in our country. Uh, if, you, if, you, if you want my thinking, I, I think that what they're trying to drive to is, is a, a, a nation where we all sort of have like a high deductible health plan, where everybody has health insurance coverage and you're never going to go bankrupt because you get sick but you're going to have to think twice before you go to the doctor. Now, obviously, there's some downsides to that as well, because if you're sick, you need to go to the doctor. But um, uh, it's really striking a balance between what is the minimum that you need on the, on, the, on the one hand and the maximum that you need on the other hand to really get everybody insured but get everybody engaged as an effective health care consumer. Okay, and uh, you know, and you know, I mean, can you also? Um, I'm always talking to people about how that you know that there needs to be revenue generation um, to cover the law because um, in order to keep it going, you know, and I talk to people about um, you know getting hit, employers getting hit with fines of one million dollars for privacy and HIPAA violations um, and things like that. Can you know, and then um, being more careful with. Um, you know, their fiduciary duties and fines that are ERISA. Do you mind touching on that a little, too, so it's not just uh, coming from me so people can be aware of that? Yeah, well, I mean, you know, uh, without a doubt, I think we're going to see stepped-up enforcement across the board. We've already seen it under HIPAA. Uh, HIPAA is a little bit more of a mature law than the Affordable Care Act, and what we've seen is that uh, there wasn't enough enforcement going on on the HIPAA side, and whether you link that to revenue creation is another story, but there wasn't enough enforcement going on and so they really beefed things up in 2009, and now they have HIPAA police, and they have aud an audit protocol created, and, and members of the HIPAA police were actually called before Congress and taken to task because they weren't really enforcing these requirements. What The message you've seen from the Department of Labor has been the same all along, and that is that uh, we understand this is a new law, we understand it is complex and confusing to comply with, but uh, so as a result, for the first couple of years, we're going to take sort of a, uh, compliance assistance rather than an enforcement perspective. Uh, but down the road, and when they say down the road, they're talking about 2014, 2015, 2016, they said you need to start shifting and turning toward, we're going to shift and turn towards uh, compliance enforcement uh, through audits and penalties and fines, et cetera. So, you know, it's all a natural progression. We saw this happen for years on the qualified plan side, and, and we're even seeing uh, that still coming to maturation, but we're seeing big penalties on that side. And I think that the welfare side was always under-regulated or un less regulated. And we're now seeing more structure come to that side of the aisle, uh, and I think we're going to see corresponding penalties to, to demonstrate that the agencies are serious about this. And um, another question that just came up is, oh, and we could go back to that, so if you're an agent or broker or an employer, how concerned should you be about fines? Is it something that you don't need to worry about, or is it something that if you're not on top of things that, you know, it could put you upside down? Uh, yeah, it could be a problem. Um, I mean, you are, when you, when you look at uh, the DOL audit letter that's going around now, we've seen it because a number of our clients have been audited. They're auditing the, uh, the Affordable Care Act, among other things, obviously, COBRA, et cetera. But, uh, the questions on that audit sheet are now specific to the Affordable Care Act, and uh, you know this is happening regularly. I, I wouldn't say that it's rare that one of my clients gets audited by the DOL for com welfare compliance and more specifically Affordable Care Act compliance. So it's absolutely something to be concerned about. So you got to watch out for those HIPAA police, huh? Do they have special <laughs> uniforms? Yeah, yeah, right. They're little hippopotamuses walking around in police uniforms. There we go. And. Um, 
uh, one last question, because um, we're almost at our time at 3 o'clock, is a question came in and said, um, can, you, um, uh, can you extend a waiting period beyond 90 days if it's a spouse of an employee? That's a good question. Uh, generally, the answer is no. If a spouse is eligible for coverage under the plan, they're subject to the same waiting period rule. Uh, now, that being said, there are some exceptions to the 90-day waiting period rule um, that in some instances allow you to delay more than 90 days. Uh, they're pretty exotic, and they don't ensure compliance with the employer share responsibility requirement. So the safest approach is to let spouses in with 90 days, within 90 days. Uh, there are some alternatives out there, but that's the general rule. Okay. Um, you know, that kind of sums up our presentation today. Um, I want to thank Ben Conley from Cypress Shaw. He's one of the top healthcare reform experts out there on a national basis and one of our uh, instructors. If anybody has any questions, they can email us or Ben directly. Um, ben, do you have any parting uh, words of wisdom or advice for those on the call? Oh, I think you're on mute. Maybe someone put you on mute. Can you hear me now? Yeah, we can hear you. My only words uh, are, are words of encouragement. Good luck. It's going to be a busy next couple months. Um, and do you, what do you think about, uh, you might have, uh, I, I don't know when you came onto the webcast, um, you know, I was telling everyone that this is a great time for innovation in, uh, you know, in employee benefits and health care, that when costs, when things are good, then people don't look at cost savings. And, you know, and now what I'm hearing from a lot of the carriers, a lot of the employers, this is going to be a time for innovation and for them to change things. What are, you, what are your thoughts on that? Couldn't agree more. Um, you know, people that are coming into the market for the first time are looking for alternatives. Uh, you know, for better or worse, employers are taking advantage of this opportunity to make changes to their health plan and blame it on Obamacare, uh, which usually falls upon a sympathetic ear. So, uh, you know, if you're going to make a shift, uh, now is the time to do it because uh, there's enough tumult in the market right now that, that it can kind of get lost in the shuffle. So are you saying your advice is make changes and blame it on Obama? <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for joining us today. As I said, if, uh, we'll make this webcast available in the next 48 hours. Um, and please feel free to reach out to Ben. Ben, do you want to tell everyone your email address? Sure. It's uh, bconley at cyfarth.com. That's B-C-O-N-L-E-Y at S-E-Y-F-A-R-T-H.com. Thanks, everyone, and thanks, Ben. Everyone, uh, you know, have a great afternoon, and catch up with you on the next webcast. Take care.